Hello everyone. This is the first video lecture of um, week five. Um, this week we are venturing into the early Bronze Age um, in Western Asia. So um, we want to talk about the Bronze Age cities of southern Mesopotamia particularly um, and the emergence of an urban elite. Um, this is um, this is a, a phenomenon we're going to be looking at in during the third millennium BCE in southern uh, Mesopotamia. Um, last week we focused, um, as you will recall, we focused on um, the urban revolution and Uruk, uh, particularly in southern Mesopotamia, the emergence of first cities. Um, and what did those first cities really look like as ceremonial centers, um, urban centers forming around um, temple complexes, uh, particularly in southern Mesopotamia. And we also looked at <clears throat> particular innovations both in architecture and in visual culture. Um, in architecture, we, we saw that the development of these kind of urban um, monumental building traditions coming in, particularly in the context of the temple complex at Uruk. Um, and we also saw a kind of a new culture of um, offerings um, that are being brought to the, to the temple, like the Uruk ways, um, as you will see. Um, and, and we saw that in Uruk, we started to see, with the invention of um, writing as well, just around this time uh, period, um, we also saw the formation of a very powerful visual culture um, that we exemplified in the Lion Hunt stele, um, as well as the Uruk ways. And we noticed how this very particular person, um, the priest king with his uh, particular costume, the long rope, um, his, uh, uh, his long beard, um, and so on. Uh, how he appears in multiple um, forms of representation in cylinder seals, in monuments, um, uh, and um, uh, clearly a kind of a really interesting political figure that combines these ceremonial centers and political, uh, political power. Um, I really enjoyed our discussion on the Uruk ways. Um, if you recall, um, sort of with uh, Zeynep Bahrani's reading of the Uruk ways as performative, we were questioning this kind of really conventional understanding of, of how art works or how a work of art really functions. Um, and in the more conventional um, understanding of the artwork um, that is, which understands art as subservient to history, there is this idea of um, a historical event that takes place, um, and as it takes place, we see some kind of a meaning, some kind of a story being um, formed around that historical event. And so the, the way that um, art uh, comes into the picture is that this historical event gets then represented um, uh, in the art, um, in the image, in the visual representation. And um, this implies, really interestingly, um, how that already existing meaning associated with a historical event then gets transferred um, prepared, ready um, to be represented and associated with the artwork it's, uh, itself. And a good example here, of course, is the Uruk Vase, we, which we uh, discussed uh, the idea of the sacred marriage and how, if that is in fact what it is representing, um, uh, there is a historical event that's taking place, there's that, uh, there's that idea of the sacred marriage already formed and it becomes illustrated in the in the image. And when it's understood this way, in the conventional understanding of a work of art, then binary distinctions such as inside-outside, representation real thing, human divine, um, myth reality, are then become really clearly separated, right? So one thing is uh, reality, historical event, and then, uh, and then the artwork is a representation of it. Um, but 
Zainab Bahrani's reading of this monument actually puts a question there and suggesting maybe we want to read, instead of understanding the work of art as subservient to history, she presented the idea that visual representation is performative. And how do we understand it? We understand it from the way how the um, Uruguay itself was represented within the representation, a representation of self and this kind of circular referentiality. Um, we talked about um, the movement um, and the presentation that actually takes place within, um, within the image. All of these aspects of performance um, suggest that the meaning itself is not brought from outside of the work of art, but it's produced in the making of the image. It's produced in the image itself. This is a way of seeing uh, the work of art as not uh, subservient to history, but as an agent of history. So that's a major difference. And in this case, the binary distinctions of human divine, uh, representation real thing, um, signifier signified, um, inside outside becomes blurred right is this the vase itself is it inside is it outside um, uh, because the vase itself is being represented within the vase um, and so and so on and what is myth and what is reality is the goddess is the female figure we're seeing on top of the representation is that a goddess or is that a priestess or is that a representation of, of both of them so all of these become really mixed and I'd like you to keep this information this comparison in mind in thinking about works of art um, from here uh, from here on and I wanted to really sort of bring this extraordinary um, sort of um, a, a knife uh, that was found in Egypt um, and that, take, take, that dates um, uh, very similar to the Uruguay's. Um, it dates from 3450 to 3, 3300 BCE, known as the Jebel al-Arak knife, um, which actually has an ivory handle. And in the representation of, uh, on the carving on the handle on the left, we see the uh, representation of our Uruk priest king also dominating these kind of two giant lions and represented with a whole bunch of animals. Um, so this idea, this um, knife, which is usually um, discussed in Egyptian history, Egyptian prehistory, at the beginning of history in Egypt, really evokes the idea that that there is really interesting interaction bit going on between Mesopotamia and Egypt right around this time. So let's look at um, this week's objectives, goals and objectives, and you know what I'm covering in the video content. In this lecture, we're looking, this is a brief introduction to the early Bronze Age cities of Mesopotamia and the formation of an urban elite. Um, we're going to look at the sort of emergence of temple and the palace as two important economic institutions, which we talked a little bit about last week, um, and also the monumentalization of the temple and this art of votive offerings, the art of dedication uh, that's associated with those temples. In the second lecture, we're going to look at this urban space of the Mesopotamian city very specifically with some very specific examples from Tel Asmar, um, Kafaje, um, and Girsu, and to talk about um, sort of this, um, these large prosperous cities forming in uh, southern Mesopotamia and their literate urban cultures. And um, and specifically thinking about this prominent uh, sort of class of urban elites flourishing in this um, in this context. Um, and, and archaeologists actually make use of a lot of the artifacts that are found both in the temples but also in, in some wealthy burials uh, that we will study. And this brings me to the final topic of the final lecture, final um, sort of topic is the royal tombs of Ur. So we're going to go to the um, southern Mesopotamian city of Ur, uh, particularly where a massive 
cemetery was excavated with thousands of burials um, in the ancient city of Ur. And, and about um, out of those thousands of burials, archaeologist uh, Leonard Woolley found 16 royal tombs, which revealed an incredible collection of um, uh, luxurious, uh, precious artifacts that were made uh, with composite materials, with raw materials brought from uh, abroad, from uh, through long distance trade. And so we're going to look at the, that kind of craft activity um, and also what kind of uh, uh, interesting ritual practices uh, associated with death and dying. Um, that took place in southern Mesopotamia around this time. This royal tombs of war is just a very unusual assemblage of artifacts that gives us a little window to look into um, this time period. So um, we're speaking about um, a, um, a really incredible um, moment of prosperity in southern Mesopotamia and the construction of many cities that you see in uh, in the south, but also in the north, um, uh, which are really functioning as independent city-states or regional, small regional uh, polities um, that are um, really um, uh, run by these temple and palace institutions that functioned as um, um, as urban institutions, uh, urban economic institutions, but also um, uh, sort of these small polities actually owned really small amounts of land uh, at that um, at that time. This is precisely uh, contemporary to when uh, to the Old Kingdom in Egypt, right? In Old Kingdom Egypt, you remember in. Uh, uh, Saqqara and in Giza, there are these um, sort of pyramid complexes that are being built before the Egyptian pharaohs. So um, we're looking at a very parallel development and in Mesopotamia instead we have these monumental temples that are being built as opposed to uh, these giant uh, um, pyramid complexes in, uh, in Egypt. So keep that in mind as a kind of a form of um, form of comparison. Um, if you look at the chronology in Mesopotamia um, at this time, uh, remember we looked at the, um, uh, started with the Halaf and Ubaid periods we talked about in the uh, sort of early Neo uh, late Neolithic and early Chalcolithic. Um, and then the Uruk period, we talked about it as the kind of um, the late Chalcolithic period um, in uh, uh, this is really the moment of the emergence of cities in Uruk in southern Mesopotamia, especially the second half of the fourth millennium BCE, um, uh, represented um, in the, those developments in Uruk that we talked about, social complexity, invention of writing, uh, monumental architecture, cylinder seals, um, long distance trade, etc. So um, really fascinating developments. So what we're looking at is the next period this week, the Early Bronze Age, um, uh, also known as the Early Dynastic Period. It's called the Early Dynastic Period because this is the moment when we start to see these dynastic um, uh, developments in southern Mesopotamia, these dynastic lineages of small kingdoms forming in southern Mesopotamia in the form of city-states, controlling one or two cities um, and, and their small hinterland, but becoming really prosperous um, with long-distance uh, trade. This early dynastic period is, is divided into three, um, uh, three phases, early dynastic one, two, and three. Um, this is a phasing that is mostly used by archaeologists um, and in when they're facing these um, these um, uh, the urban development within these cities that we're going to talk about, um, and and we'll get to what makes that uh, what makes that difference um, for us. Um, and one interesting uh, uh, aspect of this urbanization in the early Bronze Age is the difference between north and south. 
So in the map you saw a, a big cluster of southern Mesopotamian cities forming and also a big cluster forming in northern Mesopotamia, in northern Iraq, northern Syria, and southeastern Turkey. Right there are these two big clusters. Um, and these are, in terms of the formation of cities, these are fundamentally different. You're going to see, um, uh, we're focusing really this, uh, this, this week on, the, on southern Mesopotamia, and a good example is Kafaje on the left that we're going to study, um, which is this kind of really um, flat, uh, sort of expansive city with uh, big monuments of a temple, a temple oval, and a palace building. Um, whereas if we go to the north, actually, in the middle of the third millennium, we see a, an incredible uh, process of urbanization um, that follows, um, actually, uh, pretty closely and even contemporaneous with the south, um, but a different form of urbanization. And that is um, the formation of, the, of a citadel in the middle of the city with perhaps a palace, some temples on top, and a lower town um, upon which this citadel is looking. Um, sometimes this is called a, um, a Kranzhügel uh, from the German excavations, the idea of a circular uh, sort of wreath, uh, crescent-shaped uh, settlement with, uh, with gates. Um, and a lower town all around it, and you're going to you're seeing uh, the plan of Tel Brak on the right, which is an example of this kind of a North Mesopotamian idea of the city. Uh, we're going to study the North Mesopotamia and even Anatolia in that context in the coming weeks. So I'd like to um, I'd like to wrap up this lecture with um, by covering a really important and well-preserved um, uh, Mesopotamian temple from the middle of the third millennium BC, just to give you an idea of what a actually um, a Mesopotamian city, um, temple around this time looked like. Uh, and this is a site that's not far from Uruk. This is from the site of Tel al-Ubaid, um, which was excavated by University of Pennsylvania excavators and so actually a lot of the remains of these um, this temple are at the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology in Philadelphia. So if you happen to be in Philadelphia in the um, coming years, uh, please stop by and see these fantastic remains of the Temple of Ninhursag. So archaeologists have found some tablets at the site that actually suggest that this temple um, was dedicated to Ninhursag, Lady of the Mountain, um, a, 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 um, a southern Mesopotamian uh, goddess uh, who was associated with, um, with the mountains. Um, and so um, this temple, um, a, a part of its entrance structure is very well preserved and excavated by the um, archaeologists, as you can see, and you're seeing a reconstruction of it on the top left. And um, the entrance of this temple uh, was um, uh, was really was really fantastically decorated with uh, inlaid friezes, um, some standing bowls, um, these these copper alloy bowls um, that are uh, composite material made with copper alloy, wood and bitumen, um, a height uh, seventy one centimeters, so it's it's really actually pretty. Uh, pretty sizable, really kind of, kind of large bowls. Um, you want to imagine a series of them kind of really installed on the facade of the building and looking at the weaver um, in a very interesting gesture as you can actually see, um, see here. The entrance uh, to the temple is flanked by these two columns uh, to what we call mosaic columns um, that are made of a mother of pearl, pearl, pink limestone, and black shale triangular pieces fitted beautifully together, inlaid on top of a uh, palm log 
um, covered with bitumen. Uh, bitumen is this kind of really sticky asphalt-like uh, substance that uh, Mesopotamians loved to use because they had an abundance of bitumen uh, naturally occurring in this um, southern Mesopotamian region. So um, you want to imagine this kind of really spectacular uh, temple facade. Um, and from last week, you will remember these wall nails, um, these um, uh, sort of wall nails with rosette heads, actually, is a kind of a sophisticated example of the clay cones or stone cones that we saw in Uruk, uh, particularly uh, a little more so sophisticated because they're made of these different kinds of materials that form the rosettes themselves, and they're still inserted into the into the mud brick walls and forming both kind of really protecting the wall but also creating this beautiful decoration Be these are a little more decorative than uh the sort of um than the uruk uh, cones uh, which were more protective um than uh than actually decorative and then we have these really interesting um sort of um uh, shell um, inlaid uh, panels of animals, um, cows and ducks, I guess, um, that are um, that are on the facade um, of the temple. But the most spectacular here, I want to say, is this copper alloy relief um, of a composite mythological animal, uh, a mythological bird, um, an eagle. Um, a bird with an eagle's body and a lion's head um, that is known in Mesopotamian uh, literature as uh, Mesopotamian mythology as the Anzu bird. The Anzu bird um, is depicted here grasping, see these two, uh, um, two um, arms uh, grasping two stags who are um, in a kind of a heraldic uh, position um, and being uh, sort of the whole composition being a it's kind of really symmetrically arranged um, frontal panel and well framed as well really accurately. The Anzu bird is really quite fascinating as a bird uh, personality that we know from later literature uh, in Mesopotamia in the Mesopotamian legends um, and, and it kind of really symbolized divine power uh, the story about the Anza bird is um, is that um, it is a an evil creature, um, a mythological creature that stole the tablet of destinies. Um, so, in Mesopotamian belief system in 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 southern Mesopotamia in these early years, there was this understanding that the future of humanity, the destiny. Of, of humanity, everything that would happen in the future um, was written on a tablet. And this tablet was safeguarded by particular gods, um, particularly um, God Enlil, who's on top of the um, uh, Mesopotamian pantheon, uh, one of the sort of male gods. And he was safeguarding this tablet of destinies um, and actually safeguarding and being in possession of this Tablet of Destinies was a major sort of um, source of power, a matter of power. So Anzu Bird steals the, the Tablet of Destinies from Enlil and uh, puts the entire um, sort of future of destiny of humanity um, in danger. And so the Anzu Bird uh, then also, um, also kind of really um, disrupts this existing power, uh, existing order of power relationships within the Mesopotamian pantheon by actually stealing the Tablet of Destinies, and Ninurta, uh, another god, uh, sort of recovers it from uh, from him and saves the future of humanity. So, but then this story really um, points out. Uh, the Anzu bird is in fact uh, sort of associated with this kind of divine power um, uh, and about um, about destinies, about um, about the future. Um, and finally, this um, 
uh, inlaid uh, scene from the Ninhursak temple decoration is really, um, really stunning um, in its liveliness and everydayness. I love this photograph from the Baghdad Museum, um, uh, where it is um, currently uh, currently kept, um, and this um, uh, architectural frieze um, is inlaid with um, Tridacna. Um, a shell, which is some kind of a large war saltwater clam shells, um, as well as black shale that was embedded within uh, within uh, within bitumen um, again, um, and so the scene is really quite extraordinary. Um, uh, uh, it's a milking scene. It's a milking and milk processing scene from the temple. Um, we see. Uh, an architectural um, uh, monument in the in the middle uh, that with these kind of animals emerging from it, possibly made from reeds, um, and you can see some kind of an entrance into it. Um, and um, on the right hand side of the building, we see um, a really very lively, um, a very human uh, and um, a very everyday milking scene. On the, and on the left, we see uh, a complex um, a sort of uh, processing of that milk that is going on um, on the on the left, and so um, um, this uh, completes my um, the uh, my first lecture of the week, um, and in the next two lectures, um, we're going to go down into southern Mesopotamia and look at um, a number of cities and, um, and sort of explore uh, both the architecture, the visual arts, um, and the burial customs um, of these, this new urban elite forming in the southern Mesopotamian cities. So thank you for listening.